Hello, New Jersey, and welcome to the National Cybersecurity Center's Cybersecurity for State Leaders. I'm Maddie Gullickson, project lead for this initiative. We are so excited to be with you today. For those of you unfamiliar with us, the National Cybersecurity Center, or NCC, was founded by former Colorado Governor John Hickenlooper as a nonprofit dedicated to cyber innovation and raising awareness of pressing cybersecurity issues. Our programs cover cyber education, smart cities research, and a co-development of the first ever space information sharing and analysis center. Our mission is simply to do what we can to raise cyber awareness and education across the public and private sectors. And that's why we're excited about this program. Governments are huge targets, not only for their data, but also for the fact that they deliver critical services. And as leaders in local government, you are the front lines in helping to defend against ongoing attacks. You are the front lines of democracy. By championing investments in cybersecurity for your community, as well as modeling strong cybersecurity practices for your colleagues and constituents, you are leading the way to a stronger cyber future for us all. And that's why we've designed today's briefing with you as local leaders in mind. We know you're busy, so if you need to drop off at any point during today's live session, we are recording and we will share this back out with you. Feel free to share the recording with your colleagues and constituents. Once you've finished today's briefing, you'll receive a certificate demonstrating your completion as well as your dedication to advancing cybersecurity in New Jersey. We've developed a dashboard on our website that tracks the number of certificates per state. So make sure to get your certificate, share it through your LinkedIn or social media channels, and do New Jersey proud. All right, let's get ready to dive into our modules. We've broken our topics up into three main categories, including an overview of why cybersecurity matters at the state level, a breakdown of some of the major attacks you could be a victim of, and finally, an outline of some key steps you can take immediately to start better securing yourself. Some of the experts you'll hear from today include former DHS Cybersecurity Deputy Undersecretary Mark Weatherford, senior experts and researchers at Google, Microsoft, and IBM, and we even have a special message from Shark Tank Shark and cybersecurity guru Robert Hershebeck. And because we have limited time, we've added additional discussions and updates on our YouTube channel. Simply look up National Cybersecurity Center on things like election security, Small Business Administration cyber resources, as well as tips from experts on how to prepare for and respond to cyber attacks. We're continually adding material throughout the year, so please keep an eye out for ongoing tips and tools. And for some quick housekeeping, if you have any technical difficulties during this briefing, please email us at cyberforstateleaders at cyber-center.org. We also love questions, so please feel free to add those into the chat box on the bottom of the screen. As we get started, we want to say a huge thank you to the speakers who have shared their time and thoughts with us, and to Google for supporting this initiative and helping to make it possible. To kick us off, we're grateful to have our CEO, Lieutenant General Harry Radege, share a special message. Hello, state leaders. I'm Harry Radege, CEO of the National Cybersecurity Center, and I thank you for joining this training session. Cybersecurity could not be a more critical issue at this time, and I am grateful that so many of you are willing to take this time to learn how to defend yourselves against cyber attacks. I have worked in the areas of network operations and cybersecurity my entire career, from protecting the global information networks of the Department of Defense, to developing cybersecurity risk management programs throughout various sectors of government, industry, and academia. I've had real life frontline experiences in protecting, defending, and restoring information networks from physical attacks, like establishing the restoration priorities for over 5 million circuits in New York City following the 9-11 terrorist attacks, to fighting cybercrime, espionage, and service denial attacks across both public and private enterprises. As I look across the landscape of what we now know as cyberspace, I see more opportunities for connectivity, collaboration, and innovation than ever before. But at the same time, I also see the rise of foreign threat actors, criminal organizations, and nefarious individuals who can do nearly irreparable damage with a few swift keystrokes. Never before have we dealt with such instantaneous threats leveled against every sector of society 
working daily against our individual identities and assets, critical service distribution systems, information trustworthiness, and the integrity of our most important critical infrastructures. The most recent Microsoft Exchange vulnerability, targeted at the tail of the SolarWinds incident, reveals just how important cybersecurity has become at the federal, state, and local levels of government. And of course, the recent scare at the Florida Water Treatment Facility only makes the connection between cyberspace and our physical space that much more real. Issues like these that states and localities are facing today underline why your participation in this cybersecurity training is so important. State governments provide many services and functions that are critical to maintaining the integrity of our democracy, and you are a critical part of the defense of those activities. So not only do I hope that this raises your level of engagement on cybersecurity topics, but I hope you take advantage of individual cyber best practices shared here today, because by doing so, you are strengthening your state's operations and defenses. Thank you and enjoy the training. Thank you, sir. We so appreciate your leadership on this important issue. General Radigui's comments help set the stage at the national level for our discussion today. And so now we're gonna downshift a little bit more into what cybersecurity means for the state and local levels with an overview of the 2018 ransomware attack on the Colorado Department of Transportation. Herman Stockinger, Director of the Office of Policy and Government Relations and Transportation Commission Secretary will walk us through how the attack impacted the state and what state governments can do specifically to support agencies in defending against these types of incidents. Hello, my name is Herman Stockinger. I'm the Deputy Director for the Colorado Department of Transportation, or CDOT. And I'm here to talk with you about how our agency handled a cyber attack. On February 17, 2018, an attack began to occur on CDOT's computer network. This infiltration made its way through CDOT's network, affecting servers, users' computers, and data by ransomware. Every entity of CDOT's business operation was affected in some way and it initially put the majority of communications and operations in the dark. Questions like, can we pay our employees? Can we pay our contractors? Did the attack include infiltration of our highway electronic sign network? Even the question of how do we keep 3,000 employees busy if they can't use a computer for an undetermined amount of time were questions we realized we really weren't prepared to answer. CDOT has experience with large scale disasters. In 2013, Colorado had unprecedented floods that washed away highways. We created an emergency response team to handle that disaster. One wouldn't think a computer software disaster is on the same scale as a natural disaster, but it really was. Similar to the response to our 2013 floods, we developed an emergency response team at CDOT. And on March 3rd, the state established a statewide unified command including cybersecurity experts from the Colorado National Guard and led by the state's emergency management agency. Unified Command not only focused on CDOT cyber network, but the larger potential vulner vulnerability to the statewide network. Our headquarters auditorium became a 24 seven command center where dozens of experts worked around the clock to find and eliminate threats. And then when monetary ransom deadlines were not met, a second intrusion occurred. Weak points were identified and the impacts continued to reveal themselves throughout the incident. On March 23rd, the program brought full resolution to the cyber attack. In the final outcome, CDOT never paid the ransom and we built a stronger future for CDOT security. Between responding to the disaster and accelerating pre-planned upgrades, the disaster cost over $3 million. Being prepared for this type of threat involves instilling a mindset for all employees that the threat is real and involves preventative maintenance for systems and users, keeping up with the latest available technology to prevent attacks from happening, 
and the ability to communicate through multiple systems and diversifying resource dependency. Thank you for your time, and let's all keep doing what we can to keep ourselves and our communities safe. We truly appreciate you walking us through that experience. Obviously, keeping technology updated is a critical component, as is enhancing the regular monitoring of networks. But his discussion raised an unsettling question that more communities are having to deal with, whether or not to pay ransoms in the face of these types of attacks. And it's not just state governments or large businesses that are dealing with this challenge. Cyber attacks on local governments have increased nearly 50% since 2017. It probably doesn't surprise you, you're living it. Often the attacks look and feel similar to the CDOT example, where data and files are ransomed in exchange for a large payoff, usually in the form of cryptocurrency. Governments must be able to find or reconstruct a backup of the information being ransomed or pay. Attacks like these on local governments or hospitals or school districts are crippling because many communities struggle to maintain the tools, staff, and best practices needed to defend against criminals. If they don't have those needed structures and resources, chances are they don't have backups or monitoring in place to avoid paying the often hefty ransom. And every dollar spent to a cyber criminal is a dollar not spent in that community on critical needs and services. And this leads us to another important point. As we work from broader cybersecurity issues at the state or local levels to your personal security, we want to emphasize the varying levels of complexity involved in securing enterprises. Personal security can feel very complex, which is why we're excited to share the resources that we will today. But the time, resources, and strategy required to protect entire state or local enterprises is incredibly challenging. Basically, while the steps we will walk through later on will make you personally much safer, the steps to make state enterprises secure are far more costly and intensive. And your role as a state or local leader is critical in supporting those efforts. And while there are best practices, cybersecurity resources and tools are not one size fits all. And part of the challenge in navigating this policy area is that fact. So to move forward as community states and a country as a whole, we must continue to learn what our communities need and how to maximize those local, state, and federal resources to meet those needs. So faced with all of these complexities, what can you do? Well, becoming aware of how cybersecurity impacts the lives of your constituents and your own life on a daily basis is a key first step. But in addition to awareness, there are practical steps you can take today as a policymaker and individual to proactively work toward a cybersecure future. Those are what we'll cover next. We won't cover every major threat or all the tools in the toolkit today, but we are going to cover some fundamentals that will help you create a foundation for more cyber learning. With that, we're going to cover some key cyber attacks, including some you might not initially suspect and why they succeed. Then we'll jump into how you can defend yourself. The first one that we're going to cover is phishing. This is a huge one, and phishing attempts are everywhere. Attackers have gotten incredibly advanced, studying our behaviors and fine-tuning their approaches to exploit our vulnerabilities. In order to better prepare ourselves against this type of attack, we need to understand ultimately what it is and why it works. Imagine checking your email and receiving an alarming message about one of your online accounts. The email says that your account has been compromised and it provides a link to enter your private information. The email sounds and looks legitimate, but it wasn't real. Instead, it was sent by cyber criminals looking to fish you. Phishing and spear phishing are some of the most prevalent cyber scams because they work. Phishing is when scammers send out mass emails hoping to trick people into divulging personal and financial information by pretending to be a legitimate source like a bank, a trusted retailer, or a delivery service. Phishing scammers often ask the user to reset passwords in an attempt to steal information. And unlike random phishing scams, spear phishing, just like it sounds, is highly targeted and points directly at you. Spear phishing scammers might even use social media or other public information to find out personal details. Then, they use this information to craft fake emails that sound believable and real. This type of scam is one of the most popular methods used against people of influence, just like you. If you fall for a campaign like this, you may end up downloading malicious software or malware that can infect your device. Alternatively, criminals sometimes install a type of malware called ransomware, which is designed to block access to a device until a sum of money, 
often in cryptocurrency, is paid. Once criminals have control over your device, they can change your passwords, steal your money, and even your identity. The good news is that there are ways to help prevent phishing emails from impacting you. Knowing what they look like is the first step. No legitimate bank, government agency, or business will send you an email requesting that you re-enter your private information. Misspellings, poor grammar, and typos are also clues to watch for. If you receive a phishing email, the best thing to do is stop. Don't click anything in the email or share it and contact IT support. Stay vigilant, take a breath, and think before you click. While phishing is a more obvious and prominent attack, it's important to consider the physical security of our devices as well. And as local leaders, you may be an even greater target of this type of an attack. Here to talk us through that is security expert Maurice Turner. Hi, my name is Maurice Turner. I'm an election security expert. I'm here to talk to you today about the threats that you might face at the intersection of physical security and cybersecurity. The challenge with physical security is that sometimes those cybersecurity protection measures you have in place can be bypassed if an intruder has physical access to your device or systems. I'll start off with a couple of tips that might be helpful to you. First, consider using a second factor of authentication, like a security key. It works together with your strong password in case that strong password is stolen or somehow compromised through a data breach. Secondly, consider having an automatic lock on your devices. This can be as short as five minutes. So that way, if an employee steps away from a device, the system automatically locks without the employee having to do anything. Lastly, many mobile devices have built-in remote wiping or remote tracking features. These can be activated if a device is lost or stolen and turn that device into a digital paperweight. To help put this into practice, here are a couple of scenarios that can get you planning in the right direction. The first scenario, what would happen if you needed to evacuate your building and be out of your office within 60 seconds? What devices couldn't you quickly lock down? And what devices would remain open and unlocked for an intruder to potentially have access to? A second scenario to consider is, what would happen if an employee called you to say that their device had been stolen from their home office overnight? How would you be able to restrict access to the data that's on that device or to help prevent that employee from being impersonated online? These are just a couple of things to consider at the intersection of physical security and cybersecurity. And as always, practice makes perfect. It's just like buckling up when you get into a car. At first you had to learn it and someone had to show you, but now it's just second nature. So hopefully security will be second nature to you as well. Thank you for your time and especially thank you for your efforts in keeping yourself and our community safe. Maurice mentioned that there are tools to shut down access to your device. For more details on this, we've got additional resources on our website at cyberforstateleaders.org under the resource page. It'll identify what type of device you have and more steps of how to protect it if it's stolen. To close us out of this section, we're going to switch gears to an even less tangible threat, but one that now takes place in our world daily, that of misinformation and disinformation. And while there, this might not always seem like a direct connection to cybersecurity, a lot of our cyber vulnerabilities depend on what we believe to be true. So for this discussion, we have NCC's Chief Strategy Officer and resident cybersecurity expert, Mark Weatherford, to share some insights. Hello, my name is Mark Weatherford, and I'm the Chief Strategy Officer at the National Cybersecurity Center. I previously served as the first Deputy Undersecretary for Cybersecurity at the Department of Homeland Security in the Obama administration, and was the first Chief Information Security Officer in the state of California in the Schwarzenegger administration. I also served as Colorado's first Chief Information Security Officer under both Governor Bill Owens and Governor Bill Ritter. 
The challenges of misinformation and disinformation are everywhere today. And while the recent Russian misinformation campaigns to distract American voters and the ongoing fake news about COVID-19 are front and center, they're only the most visible. History is rife with fake news. Everything from Sasquatch to the Flat Earth Society and aliens from Mars to the Pigman. Someone is always out there looking for new ways to exploit those people willing to listen. You may remember the Twitter incident in 2013 when hackers compromised the Associated Press Twitter account and tweeted that there had been explosions at the White House. This was a legitimate source, so most people, for a very short time, assumed the information was factual. The stock market even took a quick but dramatic dip following that tweet. I recently read a story about a sign taped to an elevator in an apartment building informing people that using the elevator would soon cost $35 a month. The tenants were outraged and launched a social media attack on the building manager only to find out that it was a prank. Unfortunately, the damage was done and cleaning up the mess took far longer than starting it. A quote attributed to Mark Twain goes, a lie can travel around the globe while the truth is still putting on its shoes. With the vast reach of social media today, that quote should be amended to say, a lie can travel to the moon and back while the truth is still sleeping. Misinformation is simply false information, while disinformation is the intentional spreading of that misinformation. While the strict definitions are slightly different, disinformation is a challenge today because social media has created vast opportunities for sharing information that simply didn't exist just 10 or 20 years ago. Combating disinformation is a challenge, make no bones about it. But there are a few things we can all do, and they involve critically thinking about and evaluating information before sharing it. It's an unfortunate sign of the times that we should all be a little paranoid about what we read online today. Here are eight things to critically evaluate before reacting to social media clickbait. One, can you readily identify the source of the information and is the source credible? Sometimes it's difficult to determine, but if it sounds sketchy, it probably is. Two, are there multiple sources providing the same information or is it just one lone enlightened source? That's a red flag. Three, does it evoke a strong emotional response? Memes have become notorious for generating quick emotional responses because it's so simple to just repost or retweet a meme without even thinking about it. Four, does it sound absurd on its surface? Again, sketchy probably is. Five, check the dates. Stories and pictures often resurface years after originally posted, usually with just a new twist on the message. Six, is it time sensitive or is it gonna cost you something? These are always red flags. Seven, does it appear to be just satire or is someone just trolling for fun? Eight, does it leave you with questions like something seems missing here or these facts don't add up to a complete story? If so, maybe dig a little deeper before becoming another victim in the threat of disinformation. Disinformation and fake news are tearing at the fabric of our national and even global society, pitting family members against family members, friends against friends, and political parties against political parties. All of us need to be consciously aware of how we're consuming information, and more importantly, how we're sharing and spreading information to ensure we aren't contributing to the problem. With some simple critical thinking, we can all be part of the solution. That was a lot of great information. And now that we know a little bit more about how criminals might be thinking about getting our information, we can jump into some key steps you can take to protect yourself. And again, this is crucial because the safer that you are, the safer your colleagues and constituents are. To try to make remembering some of these key points even easier and hopefully a little fun, I promise you, you'll never hear the word duped the same way again, we've outlined the top tips for practicing excellent cyber hygiene into a hopefully easy to remember acronym that Robert Herjavec, Shark Tank star and founder and CEO of the Herjavec Group has been kind enough to break down for us. Hi, this is Robert Herjavec. You might know me from Shark Tank. What you might not know is I'm a cybersecurity expert. You know why I'm an expert? Because I've been doing it for 30 years. I started in my 20s with mainframe security, did a lot of VPN and firewalls and all that kind of stuff. And today 
I run the Hergevac Group, and we're one of the world's leading managed security and complex security companies. We do everything from design and consulting and managing large environments, including many government organizations. And we all know, especially governments, how much we are all under attack. The level of attacks is increasing at a rate never seen before. And it's just gonna continue with this post COVID world and everyone working from home and the digital economy, it's only gonna get harder. And you know what? You gotta stay smart online and don't get duped. And what does that mean? Deploy multi-factor authentication. Update your software regularly. Passwords, make them stronger. Your first dog is not enough or your kids' names, make them stronger. Encrypt your messages, files, and backups. Don't click on things you shouldn't. Thank you so much, sir. All right, now let's dig into the details. To get started with deploying multi-factor authentication, we're pleased to have Lucian Tio, Google's online global safety lead, to help clarify what multi-factor authentication is and how we can and should be using it. Hi, I'm Lucian Tio, online safety lead at Google. Most of us are used to logging into our various devices and online accounts using a single factor of authentication, like a password. At this point, you would have learned how to create strong passwords, and you'd also know that you should be using unique passwords for every account you have. But given the growing sophistication of cyber threats, especially those aimed at sensitive information held by state legislators and government employees, you might want to consider using more than one type of authentication or what's called multi-factor authentication. Enabling multi-factor authentication is like adding a pin-activated security system on top of your normal lock you already have on your front door. Multi-factor authentication incorporates different pieces of information like something you know, something you have, and even something you are. Something you know is the most common type of authentication passwords, passphrases, PIN numbers, secret questions, and smartphone swipe patterns all fall into this category. These types of authentication are great, but adding at least one other form of protection is critical for good cybersecurity. Something you have is another type of authentication that requires a piece of physical hardware. This could be a USB key, a smart card, or a random code generated on a dongle. Codes sent to your phone via SMS would also fall into this category, though SMS authentication can fail if you should become a victim of SIM swapping. A better alternative for something you have would be an authenticator app such as Google Authenticator, which requires you to have your physical phone in your possession. You could also use personal biometrics such as fingerprint scans, facial recognition, iris scan, or even a voice print as a form of authentication. These types of authentication are more difficult to compromise. Most online accounts offer steps for at least two-factor authentication and keep an eye out for the common question of would you like to use multi-factor authentication or would you like to enable two-factor authentication when you sign in or create an account. Your IT department can also help guide you to these options. Though any of your accounts that contain personal information should be protected, it is important to be extra vigilant with your email, social media, and financial accounts, as they are some of the most commonly targeted by cyber criminals and can be especially damaging for civic leaders and state legislators. Besides the obvious theft of information and finances, bad actors can use your accounts to pose as you and deploy harmful and inaccurate news and information. For additional information about setting up multi-factor authentication, contact the specific software or account you're trying to protect. But ultimately, setting up multi-factor authentication is relatively simple and significantly more effective than a simple username and password. And trust me, the extra steps you take to deploy multi-factor authentication 
on your account, especially in addition to the rest of the dupe practices, will make you safer. Next up is talking through software updates, why they matter and how to do them. Software updates are particularly useful in protecting against malware attacks. Here to share with us what to do is Ethan Chumley, Senior Cybersecurity Strategist for Microsoft's Defending Democracy program. Hi, I'm Ethan Chumley with Microsoft's Cybersecurity and Democracy team. And I'm here today to talk to you a bit about hygiene. And no, I don't mean the flossing or the scrubbing kind that are part of your daily routine. I'm referring to cyber hygiene, a critical part of keeping your computer system secure. If you're not sure what hygiene looks like, just think of those little pop-up windows that ask you to install the latest operating system version, the latest app update, or that next patch. And I know, just like you, waiting to install those updates during an already busy day can seem tedious, but this is a key practice to maintaining good security. Getting in the habit of downloading and installing the latest software updates is an easy way to keep yourself, your networks, and your computer safe from a security incident. Why? Because when bugs or vulnerabilities are found in software, they're typically fixed quickly by the software vendors, but it is then dependent on you to install those latest updates when prompted. Just like flossing, updating your systems is a routine preventative action that can keep intruders out and keep your data safe. Not to mention, it's a lot cheaper to be preventative than to clean up after the fact. We encourage regular updates across all of your devices, from the apps on your phone to the software on your laptops, even the smart fridge and Wi-Fi connected thermostats you may have in your home. Of course, your IT departments need to update shared servers and websites and backend systems too. Patching and restarting those shared servers might cause some downtime and feel inconvenient, but well-communicated maintenance windows during off-peak hours are essential to good security across all IT-owned systems. Your security needs are ongoing and they're constantly evolving. There are bad guys out there hoping that you don't apply the latest patches and updates because you'll just be making their jobs easier. Many of the hacks we hear about these days were avoidable as they relied on victims' computers running old and out-of-date software, often a result of ignoring patches and delaying major software updates for weeks, months, or even years. If you're watching this video, that means you're a leader in your community. This means you are in a position to contribute to a culture of security. And as a leader, you're in the position to help your organization align to security best practices. This might mean allocating funds or asking your IT teams about how they're managing updates responsibly. And finally, it means you're in the position to encourage the community, businesses, nonprofits, and other organizations around you to practice good cyber hygiene, to make sure they are updating their systems and that everyone is encouraging one another to be vigilant about creating a secure environment. I thank you for your time, for your commitment, and thanks for clicking OK on that next update prompt. Thanks, Ethan. Now let's dive into passwords. These are one of the most challenging things to keep track of and potentially the source of our biggest vulnerabilities. Please join us in welcoming Stephanie Carruthers, the chief people hacker from IBM's X-Force Red Team. Stephanie is a career white hat hacker and is here to give us the tips that the experts use to make and protect their passwords. Hi. My name is Stephanie Carruthers, or you can call me Snow. I'm the chief people hacker at IBM's X-Force Red. I'm so excited to be talking about passwords with you today. Now, to set the stage a little bit, my team and I were a bunch of hackers. We're paid by organizations to find flaws in their cybersecurity before criminals do. Now, with that being said, I wanted to say that I'm coming at this from an attacker point of view. As I'm talking about passwords, I'm also going to be talking about how to make yourself more secure. So you might hear things like your password should be strong and secure or your password should be long and complex. But what does that actually mean? First, let's take a step back to really understand how criminals can crack or brute force passwords. 
So let's say you're signing up for a new website and you enter in your new password. Well, what the website does is it takes that password, it scrambles it all around and it saves it in a database. That scrambling process is called hashing. So if a criminal breaks in and steals all the hashes from that database, they can't just read your password. But what they do is they use really powerful computers and word lists. Now, each word on the word list is hashed as well. It has that same scramble. So what they do is they take your hash of your password that they got from the database and they run it against their word list. And once they find a match, they know exactly what your password is. Now, here comes in the your password should be long and complex. So if you take a password that's only eight characters long and let's just say lowercase letters, that could take seconds to crack. Now, if you take a password that's 10 characters long, let's say eight lowercase letters and two special characters, that could take hours to crack. Hopefully you see where I'm getting at here. Take a password that's 12 characters long and a mix of random uppercase, lowercase, special characters, numbers, just this mix of things that could take years to crack, which is perfect. A criminal is probably not going to wait years for your password. They're going to move along to someone else. Now, what do I recommend? I say to be safe, 16 characters, and make sure it's that complex, that randomness. You want to make sure you cannot read any words or see patterns. The key here is the randomness. Now we're on to our next issue of password reuse. So let's say there's a website you log into often. Let's go with your bank. And there's another website you frequent just as much, maybe a social media platform. When you created accounts on these, they probably had some type of strong password requirement. So you use the same one on both websites. Now, maybe that social media platform had not a great security posture. An attacker was able to hack in, steal the hashes, crack your password, and they now have your username and password. Well, attackers are clever. They know that you probably use the same password through different logins. So they might try them at other places like your bank. Now, that is an issue, but to combat this, we can use password managers. Now, password managers is a place, think of it like a database that stores all of your usernames and passwords to every login that you have. Now, there's many options for password managers. Most of them even have free tiers for the everyday consumer. So what you do is when you sign up for an account, it can be a little tricky, especially as you're adding in all of your accounts. But I promise you, it's worth it in the long run. And even as you're signing up for new accounts, they do things like they generate those long, random, complex passwords for you so you don't have to think of them yourself. They also autofill for you so you don't have to go in and, and dig through things and try to find your password. There's um, lots of conveniences. They have mobile apps. They have browser plugins. They're definitely there for your convenience. So you might be thinking to yourself, great, I've solved a couple issues. I know how to make a long, complex password to my password manager, and my password manager stores all of my unique login credentials. Now, what happens if an attacker actually gets the password to my password manager or still another website that has a long, complex password? Then what? Well, this is where multi-factor authentication comes into play. Sometimes it's referred to as two-factor authentication. Essentially how it works is if you log into a website and you supply your username and password, you still have to supply a second factor. Now that might be a code and a text message or something you have to approve on an app on your phone. There's different ways that this could work, but essentially if the attacker doesn't have that second code, they can't log into your accounts. Now it's really important that you deploy this everywhere you can across every account. Typically it's under a security settings in your account. Now, this isn't a silver bullet. Attackers are getting crafty. Sometimes if they try to log into your account and you do have 2FA, what they might do is launch a social engineering campaign against you. They might call you claiming to be the bank and they need to verify you. So you need to confirm a code that you just received. Or they might text you and say, hey, I used to have this phone number. I accidentally sent my code to you. Can you give it to me? Under no circumstances should you ever give out this code. No organization is going to call you for your multi-factor code or for your password for that matter. All right, a couple of takeaways. Your password should be at least 16 characters and random. The randomness is key here. 
you should also have a different password for every account you log into. You can use a password manager to help you do this and even help you generate those long and complex passwords. And also enable two-factor authentication on every account possible. Thank you so much for your time and keep doing what you're doing to keep ourselves and our community safe. Thank you. Stay safe. That's a great explanation, Stephanie. And while 16 characters may be a little daunting, think about it this way. If you use a password manager, and there are several now, examples include LastPass, Keeper, Dashlane, then you really only have to come up with one super complicated password for that manager, and that will keep you way more secure online. Next, we have encrypting emails and files and backing those important files up. These are really put together because they're complementary. They both help protect against malware attacks and help protect you in case someone does get into your stuff. Our presenter on this is NCC Director of Communications, Mickey Cockrell. Hi, I'm Mickey Cockrell, NCC's Director of Communications. I'm so excited to jump into encrypting emails and setting up backups with you all today. Sending an unencrypted email is kind of like sending a postcard through the mail. There's a chance that at least a dozen people have read its contents before it gets to its destination. When you encrypt an email, you basically add an envelope to your message so that only you and the recipient can read it. Now, before you deploy this option, make sure to find out if your intended recipient has encryption actually set up in their mail system. Pretty easy to identify because it should come up automatically as an option or be available in the More section of composing an email. If your recipient does have encryption available, simply select Encrypt and you should be good to go. If your intended recipient doesn't have a way to support encrypted emails, that is, it isn't built into their settings, you can instead encrypt the files you are sending. This can be done by WinZipping the file available when you save a document in Word, or you can just enable password to max, and then add the password. Send the password to your recipient over the phone via text or a call. Do not email it to them. Now, on the last point of backing up your files up, we recommend you back up your files regularly. Regular here is really just according to your level of comfort and work on time-sensitive documents. We recommend that you deploy a both-and approach here when it comes to backing up to a cloud-based system as well as an external hard drive. This will keep you doubly secure and confident that you have your important files available if anything does happen to your devices. I know what's helped me a lot in this area is sending a calendar reminder just to back up my files monthly and to make sure that my automatic updates to the cloud are active and ongoing. Remember to stay vigilant and keep your emails and files secure. Thanks, Mickey. Well, we have our final topic coming up next, and that's how to avoid clicking on things you shouldn't and what to do if you accidentally did. To share more about how to protect against this, we're pleased to welcome Google's Sunny Consalvo, researcher and security and privacy user experience team lead. Sunny, thanks so much for being here. I'm Sunny Consalvo, a researcher at Google who focuses on security, privacy, and abuse topics. By now, you've learned a lot about how to avoid email phishing campaigns. So in this module, we're going to dive a bit more deeply into how to be aware of what not to click on when it comes to web pages and what to do if you accidentally do. Let's be honest, we've all done something we shouldn't have. We've all clicked that link. You know, the one that takes you to a shady website or starts to download something onto your computer. So what are some ways to avoid doing that? First, let's talk about how you might figure out that you're on a shady web page. One side might be that if you try to leave the page, you get bombarded with a pop-up asking you some version of, are you sure you want to leave this page? Or maybe install our antivirus program. That should be a red flag right there. Another sign might be that you get a pop-up to sign up for more information, especially if it's hard to click out of that before you've even reached the actual content. If the site is only mildly shady, be careful to not share any personal information or sign up for anything on your way out and just X out of that tab. But if it won't let you out, try closing out of your browser entirely. If that doesn't work and you're on a Windows computer, go to your start button and look for your task manager. 
from your task manager, look for your internet browser in the list, select it, then end that task. If you're on an Apple computer, go to the Apple menu, select force quit, then look for your internet browser in the list and force it to quit. At this point, it would be a good idea to open your antivirus software and run a scan. If you're unsure how to do this, check in with your legislative IT staff or your personal organization's IT staff to walk you through those steps. Though you may end up on less savory sites through simple internet searches, another way can be from links you receive in an email or text message. Before opening a link from a text, make sure you know who sent it to you, that it's someone you trust, and then it really is them who's sending it. If you don't know who it is or are suspicious that it might not really be who you think it is, don't open it. You can always contact the sender another way, for example, by giving them a call, just to make sure it's not a phishing attack. And when it comes to email, there are several tools you can use to proactively scan for malicious links or attachments. If you wanna check where the link leads to, hover over it and make sure you recognize the source and that the source in the hover matches what's in the email. It's a good idea to check the source in your internet searches too, to make sure the domain you're about to click on is the right one. Most email platforms now have some type of alert or warning to draw your attention to potentially suspicious content. With Google's Advanced Protection Program, for example, even more stringent checks are performed before you try to download something. Advanced protection flags and may even block file downloads that may be harmful. These steps to protect yourself aren't done in a vacuum. Remember to keep all of your software, apps, and devices updated and ask IT for support in installing trusted antivirus software, firewalls, and email filtering. And of course, always back up your files. Criminals can't make you pay for information you already have. If you think your computer or device may be acting in a strange or suspicious way, or if you're simply unsure whether something is wrong, reach out to IT for help. Stay alert, practice good cyber hygiene, watch the other videos in this series for more information about what to look out for, and whatever you do, if you're not sure about it, don't click it. Thanks so much for your time. Your diligence keeps us all safe. Thanks, Sunny. Another key thing to remember as you're looking at various sites is whether there's a padlock at the top left of the URL bar or where the web address is. If there is one, chances are it's more secure. Well, that's it for us today. Before we drop off, we want to remind you to keep an eye out for your certificate. We also want to note that you will automatically be added to, share, added to our newsletter that shares ongoing security tips and access to various discussions on different cyber issues. Please feel free to share that information with your colleagues and constituents. We encourage you to check out also a new app that we developed in partnership with Resolute Strategies that acts as a one-stop shop for ongoing cyber news, as well as tips for how to handle various cyber incidents. The link for that is on our website at cyberforstateleaders.org. We genuinely hope you learned something and can incorporate some new habits into your cyber routine. We look forward to staying connected and appreciate all that you do to serve the great state of New Jersey.